well, it is 3 o'clock here, and uh, thank you so much for joining me. I'm Jess Lickey from iFiber1 KMAS, and I'm happy to be at the Mason Health Foundation here in Shelton to talk with you a little bit about what's going on with the COVID-19 vaccination process. I have two great guests who are going to join me here, Dr. Dean Gushy and Dr. Nicole Evans. Please come on in here. Uh, great guests that we had on Friday as well during the show. And we're just going to kind of recap some of the things that we talked about then. And we're going to make sure that uh, if you have any questions, add them to our comments and uh, we'll get those answered as well. Uh, Dr. Gushy, Dr. Evans, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. It's good nice, to be here. Nice to see you both. And uh, it was a good conversation that we had on Friday. I <laughs> answered a lot of questions. And I think uh, sometimes these uh, open up more questions and uh, lots of information is moving and, and changing pretty quickly here. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll talk a little bit about the vaccination process in Mason County, uh, how it's been. You both have been vaccinated uh, from the Pfizer vaccine, so we'll go over that as well. And update folks on the different changes, including the current phases that we're in. And some of those changes happened uh, as early as uh, last night into this morning. And so I know that you guys have been receiving a lot of phone calls about this. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I thank you very much for spending some time with me here. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's just start first and talk about the vaccination process with Mason Health and how many uh, vaccines have you received? How many have you gone through? And let's talk a little bit about some of the misconceptions in, in receiving these vaccines and how they're being distributed. Sure, Jeff. Well, we originally received a batch of 975 Pfizer vaccines. Um, subsequently, uh, a couple weeks after that, we also got a Moderna batch. And since then, we've been kind of finishing up our, our uh, Pfizer second shots right now, mostly uh, Mason Health staff and also our local EMS and a handful of other healthcare providers in the community. And now we are providing the Moderna vaccine. And currently we have about a couple thousand on hand. So that's a couple thousand doses. So um, we're keeping a close eye on how many we're vaccinating every day and uh, currently scheduling phase 1A individuals, but soon we're gonna move uh, into 1B. Okay, and as we talked about on Friday, the 1B phase is a change. It's a 65 and older mm -hmm. or 50 and older living in a multi-generational household. Is that right, Dr. Gushy? Yeah, that's correct. And that, that has been a moving target for some time. And part of the difficulty has been that the state early on defined the 1A category very, very thoroughly, which was healthcare providers, first responders, and nursing home residents and staff. But what, what we were waiting for is what was that definition of that 1B? And not only when, what was the definition, but then when are they gonna roll that out? When are they gonna announce it? And it, when it was announced very suddenly, uh, just this week we finally got word what that exactly was. And even that moved a bit because the governor originally had said 70 and over, then they just changed it to 65 and over, which needless to say impacts the, the uh, need for vaccine uh, substantially in terms of thousands of additional people here even in Mason County mm -hmm. so we're planning for that working out the logistics for how can that uh, how can we vaccinate that group working closely with the um, health care authority here locally uh, as they're going to help us with uh, some of that strategizing and some of the work mm -hmm. around that yeah, let's talk a little bit about the partnerships with public health throughout the county uh, mm -hmm. here in in the, this area Mason Health is the main hospital of record and up north it's uh, the Harrison Medical Center how are how is public health working both with both hospital entities to get this out and are there differences between uh, the north part of Mason County and, and the south part of Mason County? Yeah, well, we're working very closely with, with our county health department and they're a great partner to have and um, they are, are taking the lead on organizing a, a mass vaccination event which should be out in the next couple weeks. Um, I do have contact information we can provide to those listening, uh, to a phone number to call in and also point to their website um, on the exact date and time. And what we're hoping is that can take care of, especially considering phase one being so many people, you know, upwards of, of um, 20,000 plus individuals is, is handling that, that very large amount of people. We obviously couldn't handle that in front of our hospital right now. Mm -hmm. There'd be so many cars that would clog up our our emergency department and so we're, we're coordinating with them on, on how we can kind of tackle this list together be partners with it you know how we can provide uh, vaccinations for those coming in for clinic visits how we can um, make use and most efficient use of our vaccination clinic can't do as many per day 
as the county could on a weekend event, but you know, hey, we can both partner and chip away at that list. Where are the uh, opportunities? Where should folks be going to check to see if they are currently within the phase that's available for the vaccination? Yeah, there's the, uh, the phase binder. Uh, the, uh, if you go to um, the state's or the county uh, health department's uh, website, um, there is a link there to the phase finder. You can go out there, get the information. It will tell you whether or not you're eligible for, for vaccination currently. Being eligible doesn't necessarily mean you can get it immediately. There is only so much vaccine, and it's a somewhat unpredictable supply at this point. So we're trying to uh, figure out exactly how many of these uh, these uh, mass uh, vaccination events that we, we need to hold and, and collaborating then again with the healthcare uh, folks locally uh, to, to do those vaccination events in such a way that we can deliver the maximum amount of vaccine um, in, uh, so that everybody who shows up for that event can conceivably get one and that we don't run out. Uh, but that, that definitely is an issue. But if you go to Phase Finder, you can establish whether or not you are eligible for vaccination at this point. And then uh, the county also has a phone number that will be coming out. Uh, you can call and they'll give you additional information on what the planning is moving forward, what the date ultimately will be for that initial mass vaccination event and uh, has some information also out there about what we're doing locally. Uh, Mason Health is planning to increase the availability of these through a new clinic, which you mentioned it'll be operational the week of the 26th and there'll be more information on Mason Health's website to, to find out about these. Some questions that I have heard, uh, you know, if you're in Mason County and you are unable to get the vaccine, can you go to another county to get this or should people stay within their county or is it now part of the region that we're in? Well, I think that's really uncertain. Yeah. There's there's good reasons to stay local, but I certainly understand if you had the ability to get a vaccine uh, mm -hmm. at this time that we can't otherwise give you here locally, I would probably take that. The, the kicker, of course, is that it's a two shot series. And so if you go outside of the county and get your shot, there's no guarantee that you could go back to that same location and get the shot. And it's unclear whether or not we could give you that subsequent shot it, it, because the type of the vaccine matters. It has to be the same vaccine type that you got the first time. And if you got you know, the Pfizer vaccine the first time and you came back later and we didn't have Pfizer any longer, you couldn't get the, the uh, Moderna vaccine. We can't mix them. So there are some logistical reasons why it makes sense to stick with one provider once you decide to get vaccinated, stick there and, and get your subsequent vaccine. And then when you're talking about doses, back to that, if you were, if you receive 2,000 doses, that's 1,000 people. Mm -hmm. that's, exactly. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. yeah, we're always making sure we have enough on hand to schedule everyone's second dose. So when they come in for their first dose, we make sure their second dose is already scheduled and we make sure our inventory matches that capability, which has been you know, a big reason we, we've been just tapping the brake a little bit on, on starting into 1B because you know the fear is, well, we can run out of vaccines and now everyone coming in from 1A doesn't have that second dose. And that being said, you know, not necessarily withholding vaccine, but just making sure we have enough to keep up with, with the need. And then of course the big um, county event coming up in the next couple of weeks, we're making sure we have enough vaccinations for that as well. It's worth, it's worth noting, at least one of the questions I've gotten um, is, uh, are you going to reduce the dose of the vaccine by half so that you can stretch it out? And the answer is no, we're not. We're sticking strictly with the CDC guidelines and recommendations, um, which is to give the full dose. We're not going to try and stretch it in any way. Well, let's talk a little bit about the vaccine and the process. We talked about it on Friday too, but this was a, a very a, a unique and kind of groundbreaking way this vaccine came out. Mark Gresham, you mentioned that some of these ways that they were being worked on kind of is reminiscent to some of the cancer research over the last couple of years. But for those uh, who are unfamiliar about how this went from the first uh, idea, the first test to the delivery of this, it was a pretty rapid, uh, uh, it was pretty rapid. It was rapid, but it really didn't cut any corners. Uh, the difference this time was that they, they did production at the same time they did the uh, initial studies. And it's a very, very expensive process to bring out a vaccine. Typically it takes around seven or eight years to bring a vaccine out because typically there's a lot of research initially and then there are uh, studies that are done, you know, the different, um, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three trials before it's uh, established that it's safe and effective. And then once it is, uh, companies have to go out and then ramp up production, and it takes a long time to do that. The, the, the good thing here is that 
for the Moderna vaccine, not true for the Pfizer vaccine, which they did independently, but for the Moderna vaccine, the federal government uh, took the risk and paid up front. They said, we will purchase this amount of productivity, we'll pay for this production at the same time you're doing these phase one through three trials, so that once it's proven safe and effective, if that's the case, then you already had a bunch of vaccine available. Pfizer took their own risk and decided to do production at the same time, but they didn't take advantage of the federal government's uh, uh, funding to do that. We're having a Facebook Live Q&A session here on COVID-19 and the vaccination process here in Mason County. If you have questions, feel free to add them to the comments. And uh, if we haven't gotten to your question, uh, we'll try to get that answered. But we're gonna go through some of these other questions uh, that we've been talking about. When it comes to the vaccine, we both have received the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, after the first or second dose, did you notice uh, any side effects? Um, you know, definitely a sore arm, Jeff. I don't think you're gonna get many vaccines that don't cause that. Um, the second uh, vaccination definitely causes a, a few more side effects. I was a little lethargic the next day and a little extra tired, but nothing nothing significant or, or drastic. I, I, I've had some coworkers have slight fevers, but again, it's, it's for about a day, a day, maybe a day and a half. And so that being said, you compare that to having COVID and it's nothing and definitely worth it. And so what are those side effects? What is happening in your body perhaps to have those side effects? Well, the whole point of a vaccine is to develop an immune response. And uh, the way this vaccine works is it, uh, it causes your cells to produce a certain protein that then you're responding to because it's a foreign protein in your body. And so you're developing these antibodies that go out and attack the, the protein. And you have these other cells that are attacking it uh, for, to, simpl to simplify it. That process uh, causes uh, symptoms of immune response, which can be things like, as Nicole mentioned, fever. Um, the soreness in your arm is, is some of that as well, as it creates a, some localized inflammation. The sleepiness, all of that is sort of a viral response, as though you've been exposed to a virus, which you have been exposed to a component of that virus, not a, a real virus at all, but just one protein, and your body is developing that immune response. So. To have those kinds of symptoms is just should be a, an assurance. It's like, okay, I know I'm developing a response to this in a positive sort of way, and it makes me more likely to be immune to it if I encounter it in the future. We're obviously still here in this room, masked up, mm -hmm. and it, that is uh, the continued recommendation even after you've had the first vaccine, still, still stay masked up if you can be socially distant. And then what after the second vaccine could you not, or should you still always have, have the masks or face coverings? Well, Jeff, I think what we're worried about and in, in what they studied in the studies was um, symptomatic carriers. And so we know it's 94, 95% effective to prevent having symptomatic COVID, meaning coughing, fever, body ache. What we, what we don't know is, you know, what can it do to someone asymptomatic and, and basically be a carrier, a spreader of COVID, but not have any symptoms, not know it. And then taking off that mask, now you're really putting you know, others at risk. And so I think that's the reason, the rationale behind the mask is for now until we know more information and we feel very confident about herd immunity and, and uh, more data is gathered uh, to mask, even after the second vaccine. And I spent some time today in the literature looking for, to answer that very question. Uh, has anybody mm -hmm. published a study that says what is the likelihood of having the vaccine and still being an asymptomatic carrier? And nobody's published data on that yet. That certainly is an answer we're going to get, but as Nicole said, they didn't study it initially, so we just don't know, and this is taking a very reasonable precaution uh, until we know. Let's talk about herd immunity. You mentioned that, mm -hmm. and, and there have been conversations over the last uh, year or so on how herd immunity works and whether or not it's uh, based on transmission of the actual virus or now with the vaccine, if, if a majority or, uh, uh, I, know, I don't know what the numbers would be to help stop off that herd immunity but the basic idea of this is that if enough people have uh, the vaccine or enough people are able to keep themselves from getting COVID that the virus is not able to transmit itself as easily to those who haven't gotten the vaccine there just aren't as many targets out there so if you have a large population that is immune then the virus really doesn't have very many places to go in order to spread and that's the, the idea about herd immunity where you see that is uh, broken down um, are these outbreaks of measles in the community where you know people are not getting vaccinated or not immune and you start to see um, that that herd, herd immunity breaks down and now the virus has opportunity to spread so the idea here is you get a mass of the population vaccinated so that the virus really has nowhere to go and hopefully eventually goes away.
Do we understand or know if how long the vaccine lasts? Unfortunately, no, not at this point. I think that a lot more research will, will be happening, you know, subsequently as, as people are getting vaccinated and more information will come out. We also don't know how long and how good your antibodies are good for when you had COVID, which is why um, we, we, I mentioned in the last session is it's recommended for those who have been COVID positive, who've had COVID, to still get immunized for that reason, is we don't know how long their immune system will remember having COVID. If you have a question here today for Dr. Geshe or Dr. Evans, feel free to add that to the comments and we'll take off the time here uh, towards the end to get to those if we uh, have the opportunity. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about uh, some of the things that, that you are hearing and questions that you guys are receiving. Uh, as doctors, I'm sure that the people are, are coming at you with all sorts of questions, uh, wondering about how things are going. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll pick, pick one that I've uh, heard quite a bit. And one is, um, does this change my DNA? Um, because people understand that this is an mRNA virus and it sounds like DNA, so maybe mRNA and DNA are somehow linked. Uh, the good news is that it definitely does not change your DNA, has no interaction whatsoever with your DNA. It never even enters the place in your cells where the DNA lives. This mRNA actually goes to a different part of the cell and it begins cranking out antibodies. Uh, or uh, proteins, I guess, uh, actually proteins that then land on the cell surface that then generates the antibody response. So there's no risk of that whatsoever. It doesn't change your genetics. And I've got one to piggyback off of that one. I heard, uh, I've been asked, uh, would you test positive to having COVID if you receive the vaccine? And the answer is no. So the vaccine itself is not a virus. It's not a dead virus. It's not a live virus. It's, it's a portion of the DNA sequence as an mRNA factor of the virus. So it's the genetic code of the virus that our body is recognizing. But you could get the vaccine today, test for COVID tomorrow, and it wouldn't be positive because of the vaccine at least. Right. Another question we've gotten from time to time is, uh, I'm pregnant, should I get it? Mm -hmm. um, the, the American College of Gynecology um, has recommended that pregnant women do get vaccinated. They looked at the data, they looked at the risk versus the benefit and have uh, determined that the benefit is greater than the risk. So it's a recommendation. You know, it's a personal choice, uh, but that's currently the recommendation by the people that do that kind of work. Additionally, there's, uh, I've heard um, questions of, does this affect my fertility? And that's been well studied, and the answer is definitely no, it doesn't affect your fertility at all. These, are, these questions are, are kind of medical in nature, but there's a lot of other kind of conspiracy theory questions that I would love to get these all answered and out there. Uh, some of them include microchips, perhaps, in this, or you know, some plan to, I don't know, turn in, into zombies or something like that. This is. This is not happening. No, it's definitely not happening. If you've, uh, well, when you get your vaccine, hopefully you will, you, know, you look at the needle that's used, it is a tiny little needle. To put a microchip through there would require technology nobody's got currently to make microchips, not to mention the fact that if the microchips were in the bottle, you could suck up all six microchips in a single okay. dose and you might get six and somebody else gets none. So it's, it's silly. That, of course, is not happening. So in each of those vials, there is, it's more than just one dose. Correct. Moderna, it's it's uh, there's actually getting eleven doses of each vial, which is why it, it creates a, a little bit of a um, kind of it's tricky to to coordinate on the scheduling side because you certainly don't want to pull up one dose and then the rest of the vial goes bad within six hours. So on our end, the logistics part of it um, becomes a little bit more complicated. Um, we do currently have a waiting list of anyone seventy and older. We, we've created that waiting list for anyone for extra doses, and so. Um, the COVID vaccine at masonjournal.com is a way to ask to be put on that waiting list. And what happens at the end of the day is three o'clock, we say, okay, we've got two or three extra doses. We'll call the waiting list to make sure that way not a single dose gets wasted. Let's talk a little bit about your guys' background. Uh, Dean, you're the Chief Medical Officer for Mason Health, and Nicole, you're the Senior Director of Ancillary Services. How does that all play into the pharmaceuticals and, and what you do for the hospital and to all this? Well, this is definitely right up in the alley of, of a pharmacist. So my background is I am a pharmacist and um, I have to send out a huge kudos to my team of pharmacists who have really stepped up. And you know, their background is they go to pharmacy school, they receive their doctorate in pharmacy, and they really understand the intricacies of not only the vaccine, uh, of the storage of it, the capabilities of it, and they themselves are the ones administering it, a lot of it. We're, of course, partnering with nurses and MAs and, and kind of utilizing our full workforce for this, but 
our vaccine clinic that we currently have is actually utilizing our pharmacy team. So I want to send out a huge kudos to them. They've been working their tail feathers off to, to get this out and to get as many people vaccinated as possible. It looks like we have a question that's come in or was here to, to ask that. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, there's a few questions that have come in. This one here, does the vaccine keep you from getting the virus or does it prevent you from having a strong response to the virus? Well, it's, it, that's a very germane question. The thinking currently is that it prevents you from becoming sick with the virus. What they studied was, the end point for the studies has been, do you develop symptomatic COVID disease? That seems like a subtle different difference. What it probably means is that most people don't get the virus at all and don't get sick. But like we were mentioning before, what we don't know is, is there a subset of people who can uh, who don't get sick but do carry the virus, if that makes sense. But I think the current thinking is that it creates immunity to the virus and to the disease, but more to come as we study more of these uh, people who've been vaccinated. Before we get to the next question, I know you said you had more, but we're starting to see variants of the COVID-19 uh, COVID here going across the country. Has there been any research done on the uh, impact that the uh, vaccine has on those variants? Yeah, there has. Um, it, it, to some extent, the, this talk about the variants is a bit of a, a news story more than a reality. There, there's, there, that's probably oversimplifying it because there are uh, dozens of viruses uh, rota um, um, uh, circulating around the world uh, that came from this one. It changes all the time, it mutates. The one that's getting the most emphasis right now is concerning because it's more infectious but not more dangerous, meaning that it's more easily transmitted, but when you get symptoms, you don't get worse symptoms. That will ultimately translate into more hospitalizations and more deaths because more people will get sick, hence the importance of wearing masks and social distancing. Uh, but the good news also has been that uh, most researchers think that the current vaccine vaccines will prevent the, all of the circulating varieties. And just how quickly did these uh, did these mutate like that? Well, here you go. And that's the point of a virus. I mean, that's what a virus does. Right? They do that. You can look at the annual flu virus that we get. You have to get a flu shot every year, and it's for a different strain of flu viruses that are uh, that are uh, uh, circulating around the world. So they mutate that rapidly. Um, this one uh, mutates much like other viruses do. Um, uh, how how often? I don't know. The first one that was identified in in China hit the west coast of the United States, that's what hit uh, here in Washington first. They now think that a, a mutated version from Europe uh, hit New York, and so it was a different strain that hit there. And there's, you know, as I said, tens of different varieties of this that's circulating now. Arla, do you have any other questions? Yeah, there's some questions about, um, you know, some news articles that have been posted about deaths from the vaccine in particular. Um, 13 elderly folks who died in Norway. You know, what are your thoughts on when you hear some of these types of stories? Um, well, I can speak to the fact that we haven't had a single uh, allergic reaction that I know of or heard of yet. Um, uh, we do have partner hospitals that have. There, I have not heard of any deaths locally. Um, you know, I, I think they're, they're like any medication or any medicine you get, there is a bit of a risk in it, but I, you know, I think it's a bit of a stretch to say every one of those deaths maybe was attributed to the vaccine. So um, I can't speak to that article, I don't know if you read it. Yeah, no, I, I didn't read that specific one. The data that I've seen suggests that the, the uh, uh, number of serious reactions, including deaths, is not out of line with what you see with other vaccines. Mm -hmm. All vaccines have mm -hmm. that issue. If you look at uh, annual uh, flu, uh, there are deaths associated with the annual flu virus vaccine. Um, and this one is not out of line and does not appear to be any more risky than, in that regard. And that being said, for everyone getting vaccinated, we make sure that they stay with us for, for the first 15 minutes, which is when you would have an anaphylactic uh, life uh, threatening reaction. And a little bit of that, uh, of, of course, bogs down the line. We can't vaccinate as many people because, you know, we're waiting, um, they're in line, we have to. Um, go by social distancing, but at the same time, it's also ensuring and, and recognizing that, hey, we want to make sure we're safe and everyone who's getting this vaccine is cared for, and like I mentioned, we haven't had any allergic reactions, but we're still taking the precautions just in case we do. Any other questions? One more? 
Yeah, somebody asked about her husband's risk um, for the virus. Um, her husband is 76 years old. He has a number of conditions, including uh, looks like prostate um, cancer, and she works in healthcare. And she asked, you know, would that make him more eligible for the vaccine? Well, it sounds like he would fall into the current uh, 1B category. Uh, so he's now eligible under the state's guidelines, and that's the group that we're now preparing for, along with the uh, county um, health department, to begin vaccinating that very large group. Again, you can go to covidvaccine.wa.org to look at your uh, eligibility for this and determine where within the county that you live in there is the opportunity to get these uh, vaccines as you can check that out. Uh, also, the Department of Health has their COVID-19 dashboard and Mason County has that as well. You can, you can go check out. Some other questions that we have here, uh, one of the things that we didn't get to on Friday was uh, V-Safe. And mm -hmm. can, can you explain that a little bit to me? Yeah, it basically a, a, a program you can put on your phone. It's very easy to use. I did it myself. You sign up, uh, I believe it's through the CDC, mm -hmm. correct? And, and basically what they're doing is they're just they're just keeping an extra eye on you on top of, of course, the 15 extra minutes you wait after you get your vaccine. They will ask you a series of questions, you know, what kind of side effects did you experience? Um, and, and you basically keep, keep in touch. It's very simple. Anyone who has used any application on iPhone can use it. Um, and, and I think the, the purpose of it is to be convenient and then to continue to monitor, you know, what we're seeing at, even after the initial studies have gone out. Yeah, and one other, one other reason is, is you're participating in science because uh, they're gathering uh, millions of responses now to vaccinations and, and what we've seen, what I've seen reported is that the rate of uh, side effects is lower in the general use of this vaccine than it was in the initial studies, so that, that's reassuring also. What is the um, planned rollout for the additional companies that are making these vaccines? Is that still on the path? Uh, I think Johnson & Johnson, I believe, had one, and that was a, a single dose. How is that, how did those additional vaccines enter the flow of all this thing? Ooh, it gets a little tricky when you start mixing manufacturers, and we learned that early on when we got a, a batch of Pfizer and Moderna. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna lie, it's definitely not ideal to, to be using, but at the same time, if that means it's what we get, then we'll, we'll work with it. And we do have a process set up to make sure we separate the two, to make sure we really clearly keep track of who who's using Pfizer, who's on Moderna. Um, and I think it also has a, a lot of heightened media attention more than it probably ever has. I don't think uh, the general population knows what manufacturer flu vaccine they have. So there is that helping as well. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> I think we have some other questions again on the phases and the phase 1B where we're able to go to get this. Uh, Mason Health is gonna have some op uh, opportunities on the website to find out more. They're also planning to increase the availability of these through a new clinic, gonna be operational here the week of the 26th. Uh, there will be ways to schedule yourself for vaccination through the Mason Health website. And then two, as you mentioned, uh, a mass vaccination event scheduled for the end of this month, uh, mm -hmm. and we'll definitely have more information about that. We can also find out what phase you are in by going to covidvaccinewa.org or the Mason County's website at co.mason.wa.us. Uh, there is also information with links on our social media, on Mason Health social media pages to get you to those as well. Um, let me see, are there any other questions coming in through the Facebook or? Uh, no. Oh, okay. So we talked a little bit about how it has impacted you, uh, Dr. Geshe and Dr. Evans, uh, with the Pfizer vaccine, where people are now, and when it comes to the changes that we see uh, from either the federal government or then through the state government, when those changes are made, like the change to from 70 to 65 and older, how quickly are those then implemented? Is that, is that right away, or do you have to determine kind of where the, the supply is? I think what I could say is we are implementing a process to handle that as quickly as possible. I, I mean, uh, one of our, our big focuses right now is efficiency, and it is not efficient to call for an appointment, you know, play phone tag with the patient, 
figure out a time available, have to change the appointment. What we're really looking into right now is technology, and we're really leaning into opportunities of how can the patient just go online, schedule themselves, um, just like you do for hair appointments or other areas and venues that you know you can very so easily go in and say, oh, I want to change it. Never mind, I want mine on Friday. And, uh, it, and it helps us on our end because for, for us, it's less workforce to, to need to, to handle that and means we can vaccinate more. So uh, on our end, we've been uh, putting a lot of energy into planning for that so it's more efficient. When it comes to the technology, is it still uh, important for folks to either sign up for the alerts on their phones or whether or not they have been impacted or passed by someone uh, who may have seen that and then the additional use of contact tracing we're going to still be doing this for the duration right yeah I, I, we will be doing this for the foreseeable future for sure there's no question those uh, apps that uh, notify you that, that you may have been exposed i think are, are useful um, more important of course is just taking precautions and wearing your mask and social distancing and you're doing all you can to avoid that um, uh, so yeah, this is something we'll be dealing with for the foreseeable future. And then when it comes to uh, specific uh, folks' unique uh, backgrounds when it comes to the vaccines, if like the question came in with prostate cancer or if someone has uh, issues with their heart or uh, poor heart health, are there opportunities for them to get ahead of the line or is this, a, is this still continues to be follow the phase? Well, we are we are required to adhere to the government's uh, the state government's guidelines around uh, the phasing. We can't we can't um, adjust that. Um, it, it's a it's a pretty hard and fast rule. With that said, uh, if you have particular conditions, uh, having a conversation with your doctor when you're in for a visit for that reason uh, would be useful to understand you know your risks and benefits of getting the vaccine. But in terms of phasing. Uh, we don't have any choices in terms of where people fall in that facing. Do you guys have uh, any final thoughts on just how we've gotten to this point from when we first heard about? I mean, it's almost been a year. There's been a lot of time for reflection uh, about how quickly we've uh, found and identified and found this vaccine. And kind of it's a great testament to all the scientists who have been working on this uh, tirelessly, I'm sure, over the last few months, many months. Yeah, Jeff, uh, well said. And I I, um, I do want to actually put a message out for all of those who contacted the hospital today or yesterday, especially with 1B being released, and let every, thank each and every one of you, number one, for your interest in the vaccine. Please continue that. And, and please understand that we are doing the very best we can to get as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible. You know, we, we still have patients to see. We still have a hospital to run or COVID positive patients um, in there. And, and that being said, you know, we're trying to, to utilize our workforce as, as best we can to, to provide this, um, you know, and, and we will be leaning into the county, of course, for their support. And I'm also hearing of, you know, the National Guard supporting very soon as well. And I think that would be absolutely necessary for all of us to partner in this, tackle, uh, you know, vaccinating the community as quickly as possible. I think that the message though is, is just everyone's patience is greatly appreciated right now because we've got a lot of folks working really hard on this. And it's a changing landscape. That's that's been the challenge I think since yeah. this began. Uh, it began without a lot of information about this particular disease, and as uh, we understood more and more, the, the you know the approach to it changed not only in terms of how we treated it, but you know the issue of how do you protect yourself. You know what kind of mask, how far away you need to stay, what are all those rules about, and then finally the vaccine. And it was rolled out in an amazingly rapid period of time. Although I don't believe they cut any corners in the process, which is a, uh, which is amazing and I think we're going to see this as a model going forward in the future. I think where it sort of stumbled was, okay, we rolled out the vaccine, but then we really didn't have much of a plan for after that. How do you how you get it to people? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately that was left very much to the states and then ultimately down to the local entities to just figure it out. And, you know, lessons learned, we could have done that better. Uh, so now we are trying to ramp up and we're going to administer as much vaccine as we possibly can uh, to the citizens of Mason County uh, in the very near future. Well, I, just I was going to say, I think just to tag on to what uh, Dean mentioned is, I think the best quote I heard is when you get the actual vaccine at the pharmacy, it's like reaching base camp at Mount Everest. There is a lot more work that needs to be done at that point. You get really excited that day. There's a lot of energy around it, but man, you got to hike ahead of you. And we're, we're willing and dedicated for our community to do that. Um, but like I said, you know, 
can't, can't do that over a day or two. So it, it'll be a long journey, but we'll get there. Listen, I appreciate both of your time. I know it's very precious and you're very busy as we work through this here today and get some more information. It's been a Q&A session about vaccines and COVID-19 here uh, with Mason Health. Dr. Dean Gushy, the Chief Medical Officer for Mason Health and Dr. Nicole Evans, Senior Director of Ancillary Services. Looks like we may have one more question come in, Arla. Yeah, we had a question just come in. Who is spearheading the mass vaccination event and where could we find information about that event? Oh, great. So should we go ahead and um, uh, provide the phone number? So the yep. county is um, overseeing it, and what we are doing is providing and lending support to them. And the phone number that you can call for information about that event is 360-427-9670, extension 599. Again, 360 427 9670 extension 599 and then we of course will also um point to the details of that event on our website to make sure it's it's as uh publicized as possible so everyone will know about it again we're here talking a little bit about covid 19 the vaccination process here in mason county and uh thank you so much to dr dean gushy dr nicole evans mm -hmm. arla thank you for monitoring the questions here as we get ready to put the uh, wraps on this. If you have more questions or more uh, questions for either the county, you can always go to their website at co.mason.wa.us. Uh, COVIDvaccinewa.org is another great opportunity for you to get the information here and uh, we'll also be able to point you to masongeneral.com. So once again, thank you very much for being here today and uh, answering some of these questions. I know it's a very uh, important topic to everybody in the community. And thing is, things are changing very, uh, very rapidly. So thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Jeff. Appreciate it.